All right, folks. Back after the morning coffee break. First on this session, we have Joe Collins. He's done his PhD at the University of Bath and is now working as a postdoc on a very interesting project called OpenFlexure, which is about microscopes and 3D printing and glary blinking, well, not blinking, at least not right now, things. So um, give him a warm welcome and a round of applause. Cool. Uh, hi, everyone. Yep. So I'm Joel Collins. So I'm at the Department of Physics, um, even though I mostly spend my time these days doing uh, software development for the microscope. Um, technically, I am still a physicist. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you yeah, about this project, OpenFlexure, which aims to bring robotic microscopy for everyone. Um, we're going to sort of work back through that title, um, because apparently I don't know how to organize talks. Um, we're going to start with the for everybody or everyone section um, and talk briefly about open source hardware. So a lot of you will have come across open source, so everybody I imagine will have come across or used open source software. Um, perhaps sort of less prevalent in the community is the, the idea of open source hardware. So it's the same principle. The designs for the, uh, for the hardware are freely available to use and modify as you see fit. Um, and they quite often have an emphasis, like open source software, on accessibility. Um, one consideration that seems reasonably unique to open source hardware is the idea of having a finished product available. So it's all well and good you publish in the designs for something that you've, you've created, but um, if you really want to get it into the hands of people, it's, it's often quite beneficial to, to sell them directly. A brilliant example of this is the, uh, the Arduino boards and their sort of compatible, I guess, clones. Um, that's an example of an, uh, yeah, an open source hardware project. RepRap 3D printers. So these are 3D printers that are made mostly out of 3D printed parts. So the idea is that you can reproduce the 3D printer on a 3D printer. Um, so that, that also came out of the University of Bath um, a while ago now. Um, and then sort of two I get a probably lesser known project above that. So there's the RISC-V processor architecture, which is an open source processor architecture designed to kind of rival ARM and, and x86 and such. Um, and then in the top left, the Monome, or Monome, uh, depending on who you ask, is a, a, an open source MIDI sequencer. So it's a digital musical instrument. Uh, and you can go and down, freely download the, the hardware designs for that and, uh, and build one yourself. Now. I'm in a physics department, so we're particularly interested in open source labware. So it's the same principle of, uh, of open source hardware, but for sort of scientific lab grade equipment. Um, scientific hardware benefits massively from openness. So quite often what, what has happened in the past is that you'll buy some very, very expensive black box and you'll connect it to some other piece of equipment and out of the other end will become some mystery signal and you don't tend to know what's happening in between due to things like intellectual property or just time constraints. Um, so open source labware allows you to have a much deeper understanding of your, your, of your equipment. Um, also what tends to happen is that you'll buy the piece of equipment that best suits your need, but it's not always perfect. So open source labware allows you to customize and improve these designs specifically for your use cases. Um, which in, in research can you know, quite often be quite niche. And the other thing is that, like I mentioned, this, this quite often commercial lab equipment is prohibitively expensive. So very, very small runs of some quite complex hardware um, rapidly just becomes prohibitively expensive. So open source labware allows that cost to come down because of this quite often this emphasis on, on accessibility. Um, so we've got some examples of existing uh, open source labware projects here. Um, we primarily develop a 3D printed open source microscope. So this is what a traditional, traditional microscope uh, would typically look like. Um, and this project really benefits from thinking about what, what actually is a microscope. So, Microscopes are designed for imaging very small objects. So the, the, sort of the temptation is to think that the optics um, would be the bulk of the microscope. But actually, by weight, it's almost entirely mechanics. So the optics, these sections highlighted in yellow, those are you know, for 
you, know, you look down the eyepieces, there's no camera or anything like that. You look down the eyepieces, there's some objectives, other lenses, things like that, to magnify your image. Um, microscope optics haven't really changed much in hundreds of years. They've, they've, obviously, there have been developments and refinements, but fundamentally, it hasn't changed in hundreds of years. What has changed is the mechanics. So if you're imaging at a very, very high magnification, you have a very, very narrow region where your image will be in focus. So precise positioning of your sample in, in you know, the focus is, is hugely important. Um, and again, at high magnification, you, you're effectively imaging a tiny, tiny, tiny region of your sample. So it tends only to be useful if you can also translate that sample around and image different regions of it. So almost all, by weight of this microscope, is just mechanics. Um, which then raised the question, what could a microscope be? Um, so this is our microscope. It's, I mean, we've got one down here. It's, it's a lot smaller than the traditional microscopes that you've seen. It also doesn't really look anything like a microscope. Um, but all of the key parts are there. So this part labeled the condenser mount, this is, as you might be able to see from here, this is where your illumination, so this is where your like, white light would sit. And you have a lens in there that focuses that light down onto your sample. Um, the objective here, this is just a normal off-the-shelf microscope objective. So if you had one of those big traditional microscopes um, and you work in microscopy, you probably have a big set of these objectives that you coddle and baby because you love them dearly. Um, so we, we wanted compatibility with those. Like I said, the optics haven't really changed. They've got very, very good at them. Um, camera and optics modules, so this is, again, this is exclusively you use a camera. There is no eyepiece on this. Um, fortunately, very good cameras have become very, very cheap recently. So the Pi camera is what we use. It's a fantastic example of that. Um, but I, I imagine it's just because of the sheer abundance of very high quality cameras in mobile phones. Um, so you can get phenomenal imaging for you know, just a few pounds, tens of pounds. Uh, and then the bit that we're most interested in is all of the mechanics. So you know, we have so, some electronics housing. We have X, Y, and Z translation. But the way that we do it is very different to traditional microscopes. So normally, microscopes will use these like sliding dovetail type mechanisms. So this requires very smooth, very precise surfaces. Um, and they're time consuming to machine, because they have to be so precise. Um, and time is really expensive. Compared to the raw materials, time is fantastically expensive. Um, so to get a really good sliding mechanism tends to be both time consuming and very pricey. So we started looking at alternatives. Um, plastic is flexible. It, it sounds like an obvious statement, but it, it's, it's an absolute blessing. So we use the idea of flexures. So in these, in these sorts of systems, you have you know, rigid regions of your structure um, connected by thin, thin pieces of plastic that are allowed to bend. So in this sort of animation, you see that by just bending the plastic around these corners, you're able to translate this plane a reasonably good approximation of just laterally up and down. Um, Flexures are already used in high-performance lab equipment. So uh, a lot of people at the University of Bath work on fiber optics, um, and coupling light into optical fibers is really, really difficult. Um, so they use these very high-precision like steel machined uh, fiber alignment stages, and they almost always use flexures uh, as their sort of precise method of, uh, of, of translation. So our microscope tends, uh, aims to use these sort of flexure designs um, to create a sort of friend plastic friendly kind of translation mechanism for the microscope. Um, it didn't just start off like that. The design looks crazy. There's no way that it would have just you know, been like that as a first draft. Um, there's been a really long design evolution. So this very first example in the corner was just an example of how you can create uh, a system where you're using flexures to just provide the focusing motion. So just in one axis, up and down. Um, so there was this gradual move to being able to translate in X and Y, and then there was translating in X and Y that you could control by wiggling these little gears around. Um, similar sort of principle, but with some new illumination optics, and now finally we get to this, this design, which is just a sort of more robust version of the, uh, of the designs before it. 
So the imaging performance, this is, this is what we really care about uh, in microscopy. We actually have two versions of the microscope. We realize that not everybody can go out and source microscope objectives. They're quite specialist. Um, so there is an alternative. You can make a reasonably good approximation of the microscope by taking the Raspberry Pi camera, unscrewing the lens from the front, moving it up a little bit, and then screwing it back. Um, so we have a 3D printed part that lets you do that. So you just take the screw off, uh, you take the lens off, sandwich it, basically sandwich the 3D printed part with the, uh, with the camera and the lens. Um, and you can see, so these are millimeter dividers on a ruler. It, it's reasonably good, right, for something that's cost you essentially none extra pounds. Um, if, you, if you splash out or you happen to just have a collection of microscope objectives for whatever reason, um, this is when things get a lot more interesting. So on the right here is an example of an image that was obtained using a 100 times commercial microscope objective, um, imaging red blood cells. So they look purple because they've been stained. It's the, it's the easiest way to have them show up uh, in a normal microscope. And you might notice this little nasty dude inside this blood cell. Um, this is the uh, ring stage trophozoite of a malaria parasite. So this goes on to become the parasite that, that gives you malaria. Um, and, and this thing's of the order of one micrometer, so that's one one thousandth of a millimeter big. Um, so really, we're able to resolve some very, very small structures using this microscope. Um, that leads us to one of the big things that this project has aimed, uh, aimed to achieve, which is automated malaria diagnosis. So on the right here, we have Joram, who's our collaborator from the, uh, the Ifakara Health Institute in Tanzania, um, with two and a half of our microscopes, um, imaging real data coming in from real patients. Um, this is particularly interesting to us because the microscope is low cost and it's easy to source. We don't use any bizarre equipment. Everything that, that is here, they can easily uh, acquire in, in Tanzania. Um, loads of local manufacturers now seem to have 3D printers. So um, some of our other collaborators in Tanzania uh, have a 3D printer that's made entirely out of electronic waste and it performs brilliantly. Um, so we've got local manufacturing. They don't have to spend thousands of pounds to get an engineer over from the States when something goes wrong. They can just ask Sticklab to print a new one for them. Um, and this means that they can have rapid parallel diagnostics. So typically, the way that you would diagnose malaria is you would have your sample and then a technician would spend 20, 25 minutes looking down a microscope to identify the parasites and they do one at a time. This way, you have as many microscopes as you want, you connect them all up, you just set them all running automatically, and then you come back after lunch and flick through the data. Um, or, because I've got to get buzzwords in there, use machine learning to automatically uh, detect the parasite, which is another, I, sh I shouldn't be so nasty, that is actually part of the project. Um, one of the challenges, though, is that this requires comprehensive metadata. They have, uh, so far, image samples from some 600 patients. So we have to be really careful about how we keep track of how that data was acquired. Um, and it also requires stability and data integrity. We use it for other things, though. So it's been used for science outreach. We use it for teaching in schools. It's being used in biology teaching labs. It's been used in at least two academic research groups in our university. Field applications, this is my colleague Julian in a jungle um, using the microscope, running it off of batteries and controlling it using a Super Nintendo controller. Um, <laughs> works surprisingly well and, and having fun. Th these things are just fun to play with. Um, we can't possibly predict every use case, um, which begs the question, how can we possibly efficiently manage this? Um, and as many of you will have already realized, the solution um, is to break the problem down into nice, small chunks. Um, so this is the way that the microscope functions. There's a Raspberry Pi inside it that communicates with uh, a camera and the, an Arduino, effectively, that's controlling the motors. That Raspberry Pi um, then runs a, a Python application that sets up a Flask server that's accepting just JSON HTTP requests from anywhere on the network. Um, and those requests are what let you control the microscope and return things like the images you've captured and the status of, of, of the microscope, where it's up to in its movements, things like that. What you can also do is just plug an HDMI cable into the side of the Pi, forget about any of the network stuff, and use the same applications that we're suggesting people use when they're networking the microscope up and just run it directly on the Raspberry Pi. 
So it, it really becomes quite robust against a bunch of different use cases. Um, you can just Ethernet the microscope up to your laptop. You can, if you really want, run it through a wireless network, although it's sometimes a bit shaky. Or you can do things like set up double reverse SSH tunnels and remote control a microscope in Tanzania from my desk in Bath um, using some really sketchy port forwarding stuff. Um, it works. Networks are really robust. Um, this also allows us to use different clients for different settings. So again, I refer back to Joram, sat in his, uh, sat in his lovely uh, clinic chair with two microscopes and a laptop and a great big lovely network switch. Um, and compare that to Julian in a jungle powering it off of batteries using a Super Nintendo controller. It's not practical to use our great big front end application in a jungle. Um, so he actually developed this, this game controller uh, client. So we use Python for most of our software. So hardware communication, the uh, HTTP API, all of that sort of stuff. Um, not Python, our, our big front end client we use uh, is actually an Electron application and the motherboard firmware is just an Arduino. Um, we have a big emphasis on plugins. This is how we manage the fact that we can't possibly predict every use case. So we have a plugin system that can access, so you can write a Python module or whatever, install it on the microscope uh, and you'll get access to the microscope hardware, all of the basic functionality, so moving the stage around, capturing images, things like that. Um, and then you can add new functionality. And then to that functionality, you can attach new API routes and define user interface forms. So you write a little JSON file that describes how you want a user interface to appear in the client. And then when you connect the client to that microscope, it will just populate it. Um, so some example plugins. We have lens shading correction, which turns out to be really important for, for these sorts of applications. Um, autofocus that was drafted by a year seven school pupil and is now bundled in, uh, in the microscope. Faster autofocus, that's also bundled. Um, tile scanning, now bundled. Uh, we've got some members of the community working on video recording and time lapse functionality. Um, that tile scanning is particularly important. So uh, as I mentioned, you can just set a scan running and co come back after lunch. This is uh, a single eight megapixel image of a blood smear. This is a 400 and something megapixel image that was obtained by stitching together a 10 by 10 uh, grid of images. So it really allows super, super rapid data, uh, data acquisition. Now I was going to just play a video of, of me using the microscope, but because I have no sense, I'm going to try and do it live. Um, so this is our, our sort of flagship, I guess, front-end application. Um, so if you're running it directly on the Pi, you would just go connect locally. But because I've got a last-minute Ethernet cable plugged into my laptop, uh, connect remotely. It's discovered that there's a microscope nearby. So if I click connect, we now get the image of the, uh, of the microscope. Now it's not in focus. So if I just click fast autofocus. I say fast, it's not as fast as your phone, but from microscope, trust me, this is quite good. Um, and then you can just pan around the image, you know, using your arrow keys and such. So this is just making tiny, tiny, tiny movements in the XY stage. Um, one of the things I think is really cool is if you see something you're particularly interested in, you can just double click on that region uh, and it will bring it into the center of the frame. Uh, if you want to capture an image, just click capture. Uh, and then it will show up in your lovely gallery of images. So all of this data is stored on the Raspberry Pi, but you're able to uh, just click in, right click, save the image, uh, and then you'll have that data and all of the metadata that went with it on, on your device. So this is just some of this sort of basic metadata that. Uh, that gets automatically attached to the images, but you have fields here to add extra you know, tags that you can filter by. So for example, I can filter by PyCon and discover all of the lovely images that I took for PyCon. Um, and then this little, <laughs> this little dog's paw, um, this was our first ever sort of test plugin that would uh, allow you to draw a user interface automatically. So it doesn't actually do anything. It just draws a bunch of random user interface elements, such as uh, radio value, first, second, or third. Um, some selection, I would like the average amount. Uh, some string, hello, everyone. And then you click do things. And if I do this properly, I haven't set it up, never mind. You'll just have to trust me that when I clicked that, the server started doing nothing. Um, <laughs> But it very proactively started doing nothing. Um, 
Some tasks like tile scans take a lot longer to run, so we have this functionality uh, that allows you to say that whatever it is, that whatever functionality you've added will take a really long time. So rather than the client just waiting for five minutes for a response from the server, the server will just send back a response that says, I'm doing the task, here's an ID, check back in a few minutes. Um, so I can, for example, say that this will run for 10 seconds. Click start task. You have a lovely loading bar that says it's doing something. I don't know what. For 10 seconds. Um, and this is just the client is just polling the server once a second to say, have you finished the task? Have you finished the task? Have you finished it yet? And then when it's done, the user interface goes back to normal. So this means that, for example, the guys at the Health Institute are able to write plugins fit for their purpose, and we don't have to ship it out to all of the schools that have microscopes. Or you know, we can have school students write in plugins, and it doesn't bog down the stability for the, uh, for the Health Institute. Um, so it really has, it, it really has the, the, the plugin system has really allowed us to take community contributions without risking things like the health institutes complaining that, you know, uh, an eight-year-old wrote a plugin that's crashing all of their microscopes out. Um, I'm so glad that demo went well. I so for sure thought it was going to break horrifically. Um, skip past the video then. Um, so going forward, what are we what we working on? So I sort of mentioned earlier, really automated diagnosis. So rapid acquisition and um, some really nice bespoke machine learning algorithms allow us to potentially automatically detect malaria parasites in the images we have, um, with a really big emphasis on the algorithm happily admitting when it's not sure. Right? It, it mischaracterizing a cat for a dog once in a while doesn't really matter. But if you misdiagnose somebody with malaria, no, 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 no. Um, so this accountability is, is uh, a really important part of the project. New hardware. Uh, we're working on a, a slightly nicer for certain applications version that uh, I just think looks really cool. Um, that's based on a sort of delta bot design. It's, it's better kinematically constrained. There's all sorts of advantages. Um, new imaging modes. I don't know if there's anybody with a biology background here, but we've got some really nice fluorescence images from it now, which uh, is a really big deal for us. It means nothing to most people. Um, and a self-test suite. So we want to get this thing certified for medical applications. Um, that requires uh, a really robust self-test suite. Unfortunately, testing for uh, like scientific instrumentation like this is really challenging. Normal unit test libraries tend to just fall over because of things like hardware locks. Um, but it's required for serious medical applications. Um, so sort of in conclusion, you can go to the website, download all of the designs, build instructions, build your own microscope, start you know, contributing plugins and, and so all of that sort of good stuff. Um, scientific hardware benefits from openness. There's been a lot of things uh, recently said about that. Um, 3D printed microscopes work really surprisingly well. Um, Python provides a fantastic community foundation for what we're doing. Um, and plugins solve a lot of our problems and cause a lot of new ones. Um, <laughs> But so far, it seems to be the, uh, you know, the optimal solution for what we're trying to do. Um, so I will leave it there, and uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for one quick question. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Fantastic. You said your model is open about uh, its certainty and uncertainty or something like that. So Sorry, well, they, I, th I think you said something about how your machine learning model is open about what it doesn't know. Yes. Uh, how is it doing that? So, um, right, full disclosure, I'm not actually on the machine learning group because I get to see all of the data that comes in from Tanzania. I'm considered tainted by the group. Um, so I'm not allowed to work on the machine learning because we're having to very strictly separate you know, training data from test data. Um, so I will get back to you on that. So there's a poster uh, that some of the guys on the machine learning side um, presented recently that they're probably happy to send to you if that would be of interest. I'll be floating around for the whole conference with a massive case full of microscopes. So yeah, yeah, that would be great. All right. All right, thank you. Sure. Give you all another round of applause, please. <laughs>